two words, eternal life. I tell you, when you think about that, things should happen on the inside of you. The reason is because I don't have to know that he lived because John's telling me, I saw him. He was alive. I saw the miracles. I saw him speak the word to that centurion's uh, little helper. I saw that person healed. I saw all of these things happen. And John's right there and he's telling us. And you know what? The only kind of account that's uh, eligible to be heard in court is a first hand eyewitness. And that's what we have. You know, you were talking about the fact that the Bible is a legal document. Absolutely, positively it is. It's full of first count eyewitness testimonies of what happened. And that's what we have here today. Jesus was alive. He walked on this earth. He is as real as the person sitting next to you. So if you ever think that this is a fairy tale, that this is just something that people have conjured up just as a good fairy tale out there in the wild blue, you know what, first off, Oh, it's not. It's a first-hand, first-hand acknowledgement of what took place. So my question to you today is, knowing that he was real, that he was alive, and that he walked on this earth, are you experiencing the true fullness of that man? Are you experiencing the true fullness of Jesus Christ? And what can you do to get it if you're not? because you were made with an intention to live a substantial life. You weren't designed to live some weak, meaningless, little mundane kind of a life on this earth. He meant good things for you, abundance for you, healing for you. That's what he came to provide. Anything less than that, and you know what? You need to ask yourself, where am I going wrong? What is going on in my life that I'm not experiencing those things? Because Jesus came that you might have those things. You know, it's one thing to be shallow. And you know, and a lot of people in our community are pretty shallow. I don't know if you've met some. I have met plenty of shallow unfortunates. And those people are, you know, they are what they live, what they, where they work, the clothes that they put on, the cars that they drive, the houses that they live in, that's who they are. And without those things, they're not much there. Unfortunately, that's not the kind of life that Jesus proclaimed that we should live. I don't know anybody that wants to live a superficial life. To only, you know, just make a scratch in existence while we're here? I don't think so either. How many of you saw the movie Shallow Howl? Most of us did. Jack Black, I mean, he was perfect in that place. Because he's a good actor, you know. He's a little coarse, you know, not well refined around the edges, but he is funny. And he played that really well. And he plays this person who is so fixated on the outward appearance of females that it is just, it is obnoxious to watch it. And then suddenly he has this change, doesn't he? And he doesn't see somebody from the outside. He doesn't see her, Gwyneth Paltrow, all padded up and being the big person. He doesn't see the big person. Matter of fact, everybody else is wondering what happened to him. Because he's seeing this beautiful, gorgeous woman every time he sees her. And then you see from the other people's eyes, and she is rotund. Something happened, and he wasn't satisfied with seeing only the outside. He wanted to see the true person on the inside, and he did. My question to you is, is that how you see people? You see people the superficial way, what's on the outside, where they live, what they have, and the, the, the kinds of things that they enjoy, or do you actually look beyond all of that and see the suffering person that's on the inside that's wanting to hide because of all the things on the outside, all the worldly trappings that we get caught up in? Deep is good, isn't it? Friends want to have deep conversations with you. They don't want to have superficial conversations. You know, when somebody says, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. If you let them get away with that, that's your own fault. Because they really want someone who will have an ear to hear them. Philosophers, we want them to have deep thoughts, don't we? They do. They ponder and ponder and ponder and they write it down. Fans, sports fans, want their, their team to go deep into the playoffs. Deep is good. Investors are hoping for a deep recovery. 
Gardeners want deep roots. Deep implies substance and value. So when we talk about this series, he wants you to go deeper and not be satisfied in a superficial relationship with him. It's not going to be satisfying. It's not satisfactory to go through life knowing that you could have had the real deep understanding about who God was and be satisfied with just going to church, singing a few songs, having a good scripture reading, and then leaving. That's not the kind of life that he wants you to enjoy. He wants you to know him. To really know who he is. I tell you, I don't know anybody that wants to be shallow. No Christian wants to have shallow faith. We all want to have deep faith, especially when the times come that we really need it. We want it to be there. And I don't know of a church that wants to be a mile wide and an inch deep. But I know plenty of them out there. They're really big. Oh, they're huge. But they're about this deep when it comes to relationship building and when times are tough, that's about how deep they get. That's not what God wants. God wants a church where you can have a relationship, where you can build a healthy understanding about who the people are, that you're walking down this road learning about who Jesus is all at the same time. That's what he wants out of a church. The church koinonia means fellowship with like-minded people who want to know more than just the superficial things of life. We really want to know the deep things, the really deep things of life. He wants us to go deeper, and I want us to go deeper, too. Here are, the, here are the things that I want us to go deeper in. Last year, I asked some of you, what do you really want to do? And several people said, well, I really want my faith to grow deeper in God. I really want to have a deeper relationship. I want to have a deeper experience with God. And I heard that, and I've been praying about it. I thought, how can I get them there? God had to take me there first so I could show you the way. I want us to go deeper into faith. The reason why we've had Tim and Kidder preaching and teaching Sunday school on, fair, on prayer is because I want you going deeper in your prayer life. Deeper than just say, oh God, give me this car. Oh God, give me that man. Oh God, give me that woman. No, don't give me that woman. God, give me this. God, give me that. That's just superficial stuff. That's when we're asking God to be Santa Claus, and he's not. He is a heavenly father who has a world of understanding about who he is, and he wants us to have that. And if we have that, you know what? We won't care about anything else. There won't be anything we will have need of if I know how big he is when he came to be that man that walked on this earth that sat like the person next to you. But some people know him like they know the person sitting next to you. Not very well. Now, some of us know those people sitting next to us. I want us to go deeper in the knowledge of God and His Word. I want us to go deeper into the Holy Spirit and know what makes Him tick. And most of all, I want us to go into Jesus Christ a whole lot deeper than we are right now. And I want us as a body to get closer together. I want us as we grow, I want us to begin to know each other and not just be able to say, hi, how are you, and then just walk away. I want you to really care about the other people, but the only way you can do that is that you begin to care about your primary relationship, and that's the one with Jesus Christ. Because when you understand Him, and you find out all about Him and what He wants for the world, you know what? You're going to become impassioned about that too. And it's going to become important to you. And when that becomes important to you, He's going to say, I want to give you more of myself. And the more I get of him, the more I hear from him, the better it is. That's why we want to have this picnic at our house. It's because I want to get to know you better. I don't know you all well. I don't want to be a shepherd who just knows by number how many people I'm supposed to have in that sheep shed. I want to know the sheep that are in there. I want us to become closer. Look back at that scripture, 1 John chapter 2, verses 24 and 25. Here's the whole gist of it right here. This is what John is asking us to do. Stay with what you heard from the beginning. You see, we didn't know Jesus. We didn't know him like these people did. So when they speak to us, 
when all of the writings of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when those first-hand understandings about the gospel, what it was all about, the good news coming, you need to know those books. And the only way you can know them is to crack that book once in a while. You can't sleep on it under your pillow and gain it by osmosis. You have to open the book. I know some of you thought you could do that in college and high school, but you can't do that with the Bible either. It just simply doesn't work. You're going to have to actually get into it and find out about it. A lot of people don't care. You know what? I feel sorry for them that they don't care because you will never truly know how big he is. You see, I know a lot of churches that still have him tied up in just a little bitty box this size right here. But the God that I serve is so much bigger than that. So much bigger that even the word grace doesn't encapsulate all he has for us. Jesus Christ really lived. This is the first thing that John wants us to know, that Jesus really lived. He was writing this book about 50 years after the death of Christ. So these people had no clue. They'd never experienced him. They'd heard lots of stories, but John was one that lived with him and walked with him every single day. So if there were people that really had an intimate walking, working relationship with him, and they began to tell me, you know what, I could begin to understand a lot more about him. I could understand the intimate parts of who that person was because there was somebody that was actually there with them. I'm glad that I have an intimate relationship on this earth. I'm glad I have him most of the time. There are times that are challenges because I don't still know him well. I mean, maybe after two years, I don't know him well. There are certain characteristics about him I do know. And there are certain times when I let him go See, a lot of times people say, he's the balloon and I'm the string that holds him down to the ground. There are a few times that I'm looking for the scissors to cut that. And yesterday was one of those days. He won. He had a cup of coffee. Never again. We went out to eat and we went to see his mother. We went to visit some friends. And he said, I'm feeling kind of draggy. I need some coffee. And he asked for a large, never again. And by the time I got him home, he was bouncing off the ceiling. And I said, do you realize you're a little manic? And I mean, a little was the wrong word. But I have learned that when he's like that, cut the string, let him go. He was going to go down to Cedar Springs, and he was going to sing on the streets. He was going to entertain them. That would have been entertaining enough right there. He was going to take his harmonium, and if you don't know what a harmonium is, did you get that out of the closet? He took that too. A harmonium is a very interesting, it's like a little pipe organ. It's like a little pipe organ, and you pump with one hand and you play with the other. If that's not a hoot, I don't know what is. <laughs> he took his guitar with him, did, you, you did. and he was going down to Cedar Springs, and he was going to sing for the masses, and I let him go. In my mind's eye, I'm watching this happen, and I'm thinking, hmm, I know him well enough to leave him alone during those times. The whole point is, you know what? I'm still learning who he is, but I'm still letting him be who he is. It's not me to change him, because you know what? I think God did a pretty good job making him the first time, and he doesn't need my help remaking him. But I am learning about myself and the things that I want. But as I do that, we grow closer and the same thing happens when you decide that you have not learned everything about who Jesus is. But you have to learn it from people who have a knowledge.